Welcome to the Backpacking Light Adventure Film Festival. Brought to you by REI, Patagonia, z and Backpacking Light. REI, inspiring, educating, and outfitting its members and the community for a lifetime of outdoor adventure and stewardship. Patagonia, build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm. Use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. z -Packs. Lighten up with ultralight backpacking gear by z -Pack. And Backpacking Light. Stories, gear, and education about lightweight hiking and backcountry travel. Pack less, be more. At BackpackingLight.com With support from Tenkara USA, Adventure Medical Kits, Elemental Horizons, Goose Feet Gear, Survive Outdoors Longer, Capsule, and Topo Designs. Welcome to the Backpacking Light Adventure Film Festival, celebrating life outdoors. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the public premiere of the Backpacking Light Adventure Film Festival. My name is Ryan, and I will be your host tonight. And through the magic of the internet, we are broadcasting live from the Backpacking Light HQ in Laramie at the base of Wyoming's beautiful snowy mountain range. Backpacking Light was founded in 2001 as an online magazine, enthusiast, community, and outdoor education program to help people lighten their gear weight on human-powered adventures without sacrificing comfort and safety. If you haven't already, be sure to check us out at backpackinglight.com. Tonight's films will tell stories about human-powered adventure and show inspiring visuals from some of the most beautiful places in the world. We received several hundred submissions to this year's film festival, and the films you are watching tonight have earned our official selection designation. In addition, tonight we'll be announcing for the first time ever our Grand Prize Award winner, Member's Choice Award winner, and a handful of films worthy of an Honorable Mention Award. Our Grand Prize and Member's Choice Award winners will receive prizes donated by our festival sponsors. In addition, we will make a cash donation in the winner's names to nonprofit trail advocacy organizations of their choice. None of this would be possible if we did not receive the generous sponsorship support from some terrific companies in the outdoor industry. Specifically, I'd like to thank z -Packs, Patagonia, REI, Adventure Medical Kits, Tinkara USA, Survive Outdoors Longer, Topo Designs, Capsule, Elemental Horizons, and Goose Feet Gear for supporting this film festival with cash and prize donations. This festival had its live premiere in downtown Fort Collins, Colorado at the Magnolia Theater on November 9th. If you are interested in hosting your own live screening as part of a fundraising or community outreach event, please visit backpackinglight.com FF and download our hosting information packet. Tonight's festival has a runtime of about three hours and features a total of 16 films plus one special film, ranging from three minutes to 30 minutes in length. We'll take a few minutes about halfway through for an intermission featuring music performed by John Will, who performed live at our festival event in Colorado. 
After the intermission, we'll have a raffle and we'll be giving away some great prizes in response to your answers to trivia questions. To participate in that raffle, you'll need to sign into YouTube with your YouTube or Google account so you can partici participate in the festival chat window. So with that out of the way, let's get started right away with our first film. Our first film is a recipient of our Honorable Mention Award, which has been given to the films having the top combined average scores after private screenings for our jury and our members. This first of several, excuse me, this first of seven Honorable Mention Awards tonight goes to the film Sonic Divide. Peyton McDonald is a musician, filmmaker, and ultra-distance mountain biker. He has toured the globe as a percussionist and singer, performing in many of the world's greatest venues, including New York City's Carnegie Hall. This film tells the story of Peyton's odyssey to make music on the world's toughest bicycle route. This is the short version of the film, but the full-length feature showcases 30 performances of groundbreaking music over 2,500 miles of the Great Divide mountain bike route. Learn more and you can see the screening, screening schedule at Peyton's website at sonicdivide.com. With a runtime of 10 minutes, this is Peyton McDonald's Sonic Divide. I wanted to do something big, something massive that would really push me as a composer, a percussionist, a singer, an athlete, and a filmmaker. I had premiered many pieces of music in my career, but never as many as 30 in one month. And I had completed scores of bikepacking adventures, but I had never ridden 2,500 miles across the United States. The Sonic Divide is one large-scale performance art piece that brings together creative music, ultra-distance mountain biking, and film. The idea with the Sonic Divide was that I would ride my mountain bike 2,500 miles from the Mexican border to the Canadian border along the Great Divide mountain bike route. And that route crosses the Continental Divide 30 times. So I commissioned 30 composers, each of whom wrote a piece that I would perform at specific divide crossings. And when I got there, I would put my bike down, I would set up some audio and video recording devices, I would perform the piece and record it, and then get on my bike and keep going. meditating as I was rolling along this dirt road here a little bit about how you know how it connects to this music that I'm doing that's one of the things I love about experimental music and working with all these amazing composers and composing music myself is you know that we're always kind of looking looking out and looking looking out into space and looking out into these vast landscapes of, of the mind and the spirit and uh, Man, it's just incredible the way the music and the, the riding is connecting on this adventure. It's just amazing. One of the things that is so important about this trip is maybe Peyton won't be performing for people, but performing for trees and animals and other uh, life forms. And I think all life forms respond to vibrations. And that, of course, is what a musician deals with, is vibrations. 
The Great Divide mountain bike route is relentlessly difficult, and early on I nearly quit. It was only my second day and I was about 40 miles south of Silver City, New Mexico. The heat was getting to me and I started feeling dizzy and nauseous. Fortunately, I came across a ranch and the foreman graciously let me rest in the shade, and somehow I managed to pull out the GoPro as I was laying there. But I'll never forget that feeling of complete failure as I lay in the dirt and the heat, feeling absolutely horrible. The heat was really getting to me. I was getting a little worried actually. There's just nothing out there, no shade, nothing. And it's gotta be at least 95 degrees today. So I'm actually gonna stay here for a few hours and just kind of recover and then uh, head out when it hopefully starts cooling down a little bit. So that's the story. Getting my butt kicked here. <laughs> this tremendous sense of exposure that you are out there in the elements and the elements are not built for you. They're not made for you as a human being. And so you're sort of on your own and you're there at the willingness of luck and fate to not kill you. If you ride the Great Divide mountain bike route, you'll climb from border to border over 180,000 vertical feet, which is basically like climbing up Mount Everest six times. So you spend a lot of time climbing, and some of those climbs are as long as 25 miles. When you're out there doing that, you're climbing up a hill, I mean, what's going through your mind? Uh, sometimes people want to know if I ever walk my bike up the hills. And the answer is, oh yes, <laughs> quite a lot actually. You're, you're pedaling and really having to barely maintain your balance on the bike at four miles an hour when you can get off and very wisely stretch out a lot of the long muscles uh, in the body. Um, so we, we get off on the steepest of the hills. Okay, I am at Indiana Pass. This is the highest point on the entire Great Divide mountain bike route. This is one of the fun things about this ride is you work so hard for hours and hours to get to the top of these summits. And then you check and make, every, make sure everything on the bike is tightened and battened down. And then you drop in and let it rip. What goes up goes down, so we know on the other side we're going to drop like the proverbial stone and just rock it down the hills. Os rios me atravessam, os rios me atravessam, e a I still have 650 miles to pedal. Oh, man. This is not an easy project. What we want to do in our music, in our performing, is offer the audience the chance for what religious people call epiphany, a moment where 
All of a sudden, a, a door opens to a room that people didn't know existed before. And they go in this room and they see this object and that object. And it's like a, a magic moment where they're on a magic mountain overlooking a vista they never knew existed. That is so important in people's in lives and, and, and enriches them. It's, it's what music has done since the very dawn of time. Well, I made it. I didn't expect to be so emotional, but it all just kind of came out in the flood. Woo! It's amazing. Our next film was directed by Tellier Dominique, a French author, filmmaker, and teacher. It features scenery from the beautiful Reunion Island, a French territory located just east of Madagascar in the southern Indian Ocean. This film features radio broadcast snippets of tragic events while a runner seeks to discover meaning during these troubled times. With a runtime of about three minutes, this is Tellier Dominique's Zarange. Nous irons également en Angleterre où l'émotion est aussi très forte. Beaucoup d'anglais euh, qui ce sont les symboles du 14 juillet de la République et de la ville de Nice qui sont clairement. Vous savez, ça, ça se hélas depuis les attentats de, de Charlie Hebdo. On... Euh, et donc on doit continuer à vivre et on doit continuer à, à vivre normalement et à fêter ce qu'on doit fêter parce que sinon ben, euh, c'est nous qui nous inclinons. Euh, je pense que. La section antiterroriste du parquet de Paris s'est saisie de l'enquête. Et on a franchi à, 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 à peine à les deux minutes le temps qu'on traverse la rue, le camion est arrivé, on a entendu bam 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 bam, on aurait passé. Quand on vit ça, euh, franchement, on dit ben la vie elle est tellement courte. C'est depuis une heure du matin. Ce sont les symboles du 14 juillet de la République et de la ville de Nice. Les terroristes du parquet de Paris s'est saisi de l'enquête. Aucune revendication n'est encore connue, mais le mot opératoire, le choix de la date. Nous irons également en Angleterre où l'émotion est aussi très forte. On a franchi à peine les deux minutes le temps qu'on traverse la rue. Le camion est arrivé. On a dit ça, franchement, on dit que la vie est tellement courte. C'est depuis une heure du matin, je suis de boulot.
I think we have seven honorable mentions tonight. Our next one is called Ethy from Scottish filmmaker Mike Webster. James Roddy is a Scottish nature photographer, guide, writer, and as you'll discover in this film, Gorge Scrambler. Gorge scrambling is not a popular activity here in the United States, but it is a sport in and of itself in regions where dramatic chasms form at the junctions of the mountains and the sea, as is found throughout the United Kingdom. No documented descents have ever been made of the Ethy Gorge on the Black Isle of Scotland, and this sets the backdrop for this film's story. With a runtime of nine minutes, directed and produced by Mike Webster, this is Ethy. <laughs> I'm James Roddy. I'm a photographer and outdoors writer based near Inverness. I do a lot of climbing, caving, hill walking, and more recently, gorse scrambling. Today we've been in the, the EC Gorge on the Black Isle. It's in between Fortros and Cromarty, uh, hidden away in the woods going down from hillside all the way down to the sea. It's about a mile long and about 120 metres of descent. I know this one guy in Portrose that's, uh, he's lived here forever. And he's, he told me that he thinks somebody climbed it maybe years ago, but he doesn't really know. And I Google search everything, I just can't find any history of the place at all. And like just looking around, there's no, there's no evidence really of anybody else having been here for years, you know, if ever. So yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to, to wonder if it's, if it's ever actually been done before fully. Today was about getting somewhere quite different from the more more well-known gorges in Scotland and just to be honest seeing if it was even if it was doable in its entirety you know it's definitely an adventurous route and it's it's inescapable for quite a lot of it after the second pitch of you're more or less committed the four abseils in total and the first abseil and the fourth abseil the they're okay, but you wouldn't want the trees to be any less secure. <laughs> it's quite a technically easy gorge. There's no climbing or free descent when you're not on a rope that's that hard at all. Everything that's actually difficult, you're, you're, you're attached to a rope for, but it's actually quite serious, I think. I always think something like this is more like it's more like a winter climb, you know, you're kind of you're out for a long time and once you're on you're kind of you're in it, you know. If I was forced to give it a, a grade of seriousness it would be on the caving grading scale and probably give it a grade three out of five. It's yeah, it's actually it would be a pretty classic caving descent if it was below ground, it would be a great kind of multi-pitch caving descent. Along the length of the gorge, there's, there's little kind of tracks kind of running to, to and fro. Most of them I think are deer tracks. There's, there's not really evidence of footprints or anything like that at all. Look at this. Yeah. Somebody's just driven into the gorge from the top. There is evidence of people about, but most of it, we don't quite know how it's got there. Wreckage of cars all along this. Is it, I reckon there's two or three cars in this gorge. Really old bits of radiators and all sorts. Mm. You think that road up the top, how long, when was the last time somebody drove a car into that by mistake? Crazy. Most of my gorge scrambling or caving or climbing is done solo and has been for the last maybe six or seven years. Um, just as a natural progression from 
from climbing with partners. Uh, I just, I found myself going out more and more often by myself and potentially just seeking out a kind of more personal adventure than maybe you can get with somebody else sometimes. Look, it's where it's been in the winter storms. It's quite scary. But just more recently, I found myself just kind of, just more interested going out with other people again. And especially on a trip like today, when you're covering a lot of ground and there's definitely, there was definitely a sense of the unknown in the second half of it. I didn't quite know what we were going to find on that fourth pitch. It's definitely a wiser thing to do with somebody else. I wouldn't have been quite so happy going there by myself, I think. I'd like to get a shot of you going down the pit. So if you could lead, if you could go first on the next pit, I'll shoot from the top. Yeah, so if you just start, start going. Yeah, yeah. cool. A bit wet doing that one. <laughs> it's it's a pretty classic adventure, you know, or, or at least it should be. It, it should be more well known about. It's it amazes me that it's uh, so unknown, or, or, or almost it's obscure to the point that a Google search reveals nothing. I don't know about the fourth pitch. That's kind of a question mark. <laughs> that could be the, that could be like the crux. So yeah, we'll see. I'll, I'll probably want to have a look at that one first. Yeah, okay, cool. So we have to be super careful on the takeoff from this pit because it's really slippery just here. Good. This one is very slippery the whole way and there's a lot, there's a lot of ground to cover. This is probably the longest one that I've done to date. So when you're standing there, make sure you've got a good hold with your left foot. That last pitch, the fourth pitch, the abseil, it, it did feel, it felt quite wild, that swing out onto the abseil. So today I was, I was wanting to get quite close shots of, from the tops, tops of the waterfalls, kind of the actual abseils off, off the top and side on through the, through the waterfalls. Uh, of, of somebody in descent. It's accomplished. It's accomplished indeed. What a bizarre finish to a to a gorge scramble that is. I've I've never seen a, a route end in such a odd way. That's, that's uh, quite up there for sudden uh, scenery changes. Usually a gorge scramble, you will top out onto a hillside that you then have to descend down maybe back to where you started from. With this, you're in a, a deep, um, wooded, dark gorge uh, with cliffs on either side and it's, it's trees and it's, it's almost like a jungle for most of its length and there's ferns everywhere. And then there's the sea right there. Just, yeah, inc incredible kind of contrast from, from what you just come out of. Nice one, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> now we've got to walk all the way back up that hill. It's the easy bit, it's the gorge, you know? <laughs> <laughs> It'll warm us up. It'll warm us up.
Our next honorable mention recipient is From the Sea by Joel Sharp. This next film explores both the beauty and the dread of leaving what's comfortable and reaching for what's unexpected, using the transition from the sea to the mountain as a metaphor for leaving your nest and putting yourself through different circumstances, only to realize that everywhere can feel like home. Filmed on the beaches of Peru and New Zealand and in the mountains of the Himalaya and Andes, this six minute film comes from Joel Sharp, From the Sea. Comfort, a treacherous friend. We've all felt the comfort of what's known, of a common place or intimate sensation. Yet it's curiosity and detachment from the idea of home what makes us such unique part of nature. Humans. Sea is home. It's where my body moves unconstrained and my mind elucidates. Where everything makes sense, even when nothing does. The sea has made me the way I am. A wild wave of feelings and thoughts, able to change with tides to seek new horizons. Warm ocean gusts contrast with the subdued air flowing within me. I see boundaries built by familiarity, and I'm lured to heed. The wind blows on shore as if sending a message. It's a message of defiance, a call for change. Yet change requires action, an instinct concealed by conformity. So I refrain from it all. I excuse myself from salty breeze and sandy feet following the wind into high altitudes, towards unknown soils and unclear air. Pure air, fresh air, air at its essence. I listen to the wind's whisper, the voice of truth. The voice sparks flame, the flame brings motion. All that's known is wiped by the cool ascending breeze, and the heart follows. As my feet tread foreign grounds, I sense Earth's energy run up through my veins and shake my bones, striking perception, evoking sensations. I muse about the consequences of a simple shift of air, but thoughts are swept by the zephyr of the sun and the peaks. I feel renewed, limitless and alive. An entirely new world unfolds before my eyes, yet it's the same I left behind. Empowered feet reinforce the heart's idea to move higher. There seems to be something there, where the sea isn't. From up here I hear nothing but the sound of my heart pumping, the sound of life. From up here I feel the sea, somewhere beyond forgotten clouds. I see me as I was, comforted in my comfort, knowing things as I am. I see me as I am, changed by the heart inspired by curiosity. Self is to be felt, not explained. Only nature can clarify what the mind struggles to understand. Nature at its rawest. Fresh air introduces new perspectives, hidden dreams and knowledge. Silence prompts me to trust the wind as I guide, so to comprehend how little we are in control. The power of untamed nature puts me where I should. It bursts a profound sense of life, a sense of me. E 
connects what was to what is. And suddenly, I'm home. Brett St. Clair's Powder Raised earns another one of our honorable mention awards tonight. If you are still mad at your parents for not quitting their corporate jobs and raising you in the back of a van while living at Camp 4 and touring the ski areas of the West, then this film is for you. And if you're still a kid and you are watching with your parents here tonight, well, here's your chance to fix their lives. Brett St. Clair brings us this six minute film about what family life can look like when it's lived outside. This is Powder Raised. Most of the kids in my class don't do this kind of thing and they don't um, ski fresh powder <laughs> every week. People who like skiing have fun every day. If they come up here, you know they're going skiing every day and you know they're having fun. I choose to live in the mountains because of the way it makes me feel. I'm at home and at peace here. It's a remarkable experience, you know, the, the traveling through the mountains and, and enjoying the sport of skiing. I think um, everybody could benefit from the, the humility the mountains bring you. I found the Boulder Hut from pursuing more avalanche education when I came up to Canada to take my Canadian Level 1. I met Margie Jameson who was operating Ptarmigan Tours at that time. And when I met Margie and I saw the path that she had taken and the, and the possibilities of a career as a guide, uh, as a lodge owner, then um, uh, it just kind of all fell into place. To pass this business on to the Hansi family has just been the best. For me, that place owed me nothing. It was my little soul spot in the universe, and it gave me so much in my lifetime. And I wanted it to go into the hands of like-minded people. Having a child didn't really influence my decision to pursue this dream. In reality, I'm fairly short-sighted. I came to the hut, I saw it, I loved it, I felt it was a good choice and I didn't think through the steps in a methodical fashion. It only felt right. When you get to spend a week with the Yancey family, um, you get that experience of a family being able to live almost a Robinson Crusoe type existence. I mean, these kids get homeschooled up there and they're off building their snow forts while you're off skiing. And they may come with you, they may not, but it's just such a real experience. 
the philosophy of just in sharing our life with our kids was the way that we thought about it. It wasn't, oh, we're going to raise our kids in the mountains and it's going to be this whole happy environment. You know, it was, it was we, have a, we have an opportunity to do something unique here and our kids are going to come along for the ride. What I like most about being in the mountains is being with my family and having nowhere that you have to be and skiing. I've never had a favorite ski day. I just like every day of skiing. Like, if I get to go skiing, that's awesome. Sometimes it's easy to feel that skiing is a frivolous pursuit, but what is in no way frivolous about skiing is the opportunity it affords us to connect with nature, with each other, with ourselves. What you do inside, I don't really know what people do inside, but I think they're enjoying it, but if they could have a chance of doing this, they would enjoy it way more. I think the real importance of these wild places is that you give people the opportunity to get close to the earth. And uh, it's going to be so fun to see where those kids end up in their lives because what an amazing place to grow up. Just amazing. Our next film was written, directed, and produced by a high school student from Animus High School in Durango, Colorado, and also earns an honorable mention award. It's a documentary that investigates one of the age-old questions of human adventure. Why do we take risks as part of our outdoor recreation pursuits? With a runtime of 30 minutes, this is Grant Gibson's Adrenaline Chasers. why I take risks. I mean, I think I hit on that kind of a little bit before. It's, I think it's just part of how I was raised. I was just raised not to be scared of things that you don't understand or you don't know about because that's just an opportunity to learn something new. So I don't see why, you know, I don't see why you wouldn't. I constantly strive to learn about the unknown.
the dream that I had, you know, as a small child, which was just to want to ride my bike every day. Um, growing up, it was one of the few things that I looked forward to just all the time. I just always wanted to ride my bike. Um, and now I kind of, in a way, have created a situation in which I can. And it just so happens that the way that I enjoy riding my bike um, has a lot of risks involved in it. Involved in it. Um, I think just part of the passion that I find, or part of the enjoyment that I find and the passion that I have for these things is their, the sport and their ability to allow me um, to express myself physically and gain mental and physical knowledge at the same time just by going through that whole process of like you know, engaging in, in tasks that you have no idea whether you can accomplish or not. I'm not rich, but I live like a millionaire. You know I live like a millionaire. You know I live like I ain't got a care in the world. But I do. I care about me and you. I care about me and you. I care about right and wrong. I'm not rich, but I live like a millionaire. You know I live like a millionaire. You know I live like I ain't got a care in the world. But I do. I care about me. Risk taking comes in many different forms and attracts people of all ages and abilities. I am 52 years old. I am 33 years old. I am 26 years old. I am 31 years old. It is very simple yet so complex at the same time as to what is happening in our bodies while we do these dangerous activities. We take risks because of two simple reasons, the adrenaline rush and the dopamine reward. Pretty easy, right? Well, actually, it isn't so easy. When we dive deep into the mind and body, we really see what is going on. And what we discovered is fascinating. I think risk taking means living on the edge of your comfort zone and maybe just past that. Um, I think it means trying to live every day to the fullest extent. Um, it's not necessarily so much about like doing the gnarliest, sickest thing or scaring yourself to death um, as it is like really taking full advantage of this kind of precious life that we have. I'm always kind of trying to keep in the back of my mind is, you know, I want to share my passion for the outdoors, my passion for skiing and mountain biking with my students and athletes um, and, and push them beyond their comfort zone and, and challenge them. But because there's so much more weight um, in, involved there, my, my tolerance for risk is way lower in, in those settings um, as well.
And it's also for me taking risks is about personal growth. Um, if I always do what is the comfortable thing, I don't think I progress as a human being. I don't progress as an athlete, I don't progress as an educator, I don't progress as a human being. And so I want to always be like pushing the envelope of what it means to, to, to yeah, be a good human in this world. And so you have to take risks to do that. Um, you have to be willing to fail to do that. Some former students of mine once said, comfort leads to stagnation and struggle leads to growth. And, and that's something that I think I've internalized throughout my life and, and pushes me to take those risks. I love being out in the mountains in the winter when the mountains are just coated in white and there's no one else around. And then I do like that element of risk. You know, there is like, you have to use your head more. You have to, you can't just like go into um, autopilot when you're back into skiing. You always have to be making decisions and evaluating the snowpack and communicating with your ski partners, ski partners. Um, and so I think, you know, it requires you to use your head more, it requires you to challenge yourself physically, endurance-wise, um, and then it's just fun. It's just fun. <laughs> An adrenaline rush is a one-of-a-kind feeling that is euphoric. Yep. Fun. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's just, it's like nothing. Nothing you'll ever know unless you do it. When you have an adrenaline rush, your adrenal glands, which are located on top of each kidney, release epinephrine and cortisol. These will raise your heart rate and blood pressure, causing said adrenaline rush. Your blood vessels dilate, causing more oxygen and nutrients to flow to your brain, which enables you to breathe easier and makes you much more alert and on edge. Also, while this is happening, your body is going through a process called glycolysis. Basically, your body has a storage of glucose, which is held onto for needed situations. So your body goes into this storage and pulls out that glucose, breaks it down into energy, and uses that energy to fuel your body. This is why when you have an adrenaline rush, you are stronger and faster. Pretty cool, right? Well, get this. People who take risks more often have better developed brains than those who don't. Don't believe it? Well, these risk takers develop more white matter in the prefrontal cortex of their brains. White matter is composed of bundles of myelinated axons, which connect various gray matter areas of the brain to each other and carry nerve impulses between neurons. In English, it helps neurotransmitters travel from point A to point B faster, and this allows the person to make faster and more logical decisions than the average person. Adrenaline is pretty cool, right? While adrenaline is great and all, it can be very scary. You must take risks in order to experience this one-of-a-kind feeling. And with risk comes reward. But to be rewarded is no easy task. It takes lots of skill, determination, strength, and a little bit of fear. And although this reward might be great, things can go wrong. Not everything goes the way it's supposed to. Don't I know girl is not in the
Oh, ho. you good? Uh, I have broken my leg, separated my shoulder, ruptured my spleen twice, fractured my kidney, collapsed the lung, broken some ribs, bruised some ribs. Um, I did fracture my scapula um, in a ski crash in a big mountain ski comp. I've broken my feet. Broke both my collarbones at the same time, torn multiple ligaments in both knees, uh, fractured arm, broke every bone in my wrist, uh, every single one of my fingers multiple times, mountain bike racing, multiple concussions. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just a short list. I mean, I've had a lot of really bad falls, but I've only broken my arm a couple times. I broke my back like just once, but just, just like just a couple of vertebrae, but it wasn't bad. It didn't have to, it wasn't, it wasn't real bad. Broke my, both my ankles. Um, I've had like probably, probably a hundred stitches, um, a little bit of dental work. Typically every time I've been injured, it's doing something that I love. And I just, I would never stop doing something that I love just because it hurt me momentarily. I mean, you know, you can rag down through the powder, you know, off a cliff, whatever. If there's enough powder, it's, you know, you should be all right. But when you fall on a mountain bike or a motorcycle, it's always going to be painful and it's always going to hurt. And it's always, it's not if you're going to get hurt, it's how bad you're going to get hurt. If you're on a mountain bike or a motorcycle, it's, it's uh, like when you're midair and you know it's not going well, you're like, oh, how bad is this going to be? But, you know, risk and reward. Uh, I think injuries go hand in hand with risk taking. Um, I feel like if you're going to take risks, there's going to be injuries involved. Um, I think it's a given. I obviously I don't like it. Um, you know, case in point, when my son went on a mountain bike race in uh, Angel Fire, he ruptured his spleen and had to be airlifted uh, to a trauma unit to save his life scariest moment of my life was that phone call. Uh, he survived, thankfully, and um, again, he is back on his bike and he's taking risks. It's just part of the game. Everybody crashes. Um, it's the old saying, if you're not falling, you're not learning. So I think you kind of get complacent and lazy and then you know, that can lead to crashing, but also if you push yourself, it's just part of it. Those who are passionate will not give up when they fall over and over and over. They will keep getting up and trying again and again until they physically can't anymore. Risk does lead to failure and pain. But more importantly, it leads to determination and perseverance. <laughs> While these risk takers continue <laughs> to get injured, but keep coming back for more. Still here. Others seem to wonder. Why? It's like to hike up a mountain and just to be in the most beautiful country in the world, like the beautiful scenery, like the things that we get to see when they're in the back country. And I say this all the time that 99.999% of the world will never see what I see and what the, what the people that I'm with see in the back country. And when you're hiking up a mountain, I just get giddy and sometimes I just start laughing because it's just such an amazing experience and just so grandiose and it's just, you know, a hawk flies by, a bald eagle flies by, I haven't seen a Sasquatch or a Yeti, but, you know, can you imagine? But anyway, I digress. It's just the most beautiful thing in the world. And then, and that's just the hike up. And then the ride down, ah. God must be a lonely man sitting high up above in his chair.
tell yourself it's fine. It's probably just a phase. It's probably all up in your If you're not scared, if you're not scared, why even do it? I mean, that's part of the whole, you know, adrenaline of sports, of extreme sports and doing risky activity is, is being terrified. I mean, the, the adrenaline and the high that you get after being, like, terrified and then pulling it off, you're just, like, hooting and hollering. And it's just, like, the greatest high and the greatest feeling you can possibly have. And, unfortunately, you chase that high all the time. It's like a, little, it's like a drug, you know. I, I, can't, I need to scare myself at least a couple times a week, whether it's... It's on my street bike, riding around town, or mountain biking, or dropping this on a mountain bike, or going in the backcountry, or skateboarding, whatever. I need to scare myself at least a couple times a week. Otherwise, I don't feel good. It's that high. You need that high. Being safe out there and being smart, and not just hucking just for the sake of hucking. Um, uh, that being said, though, I've done plenty of things that would be construed as being pretty risky. Do I think I'm a drone junkie? Absolutely. I mean, without a doubt. Like, yeah. And it's just a question of finding it. As one gets older and more experienced in life, you have to find, yeah, different adrenaline junkie experiences, unfortunately. Or fortunately. I think it's fortunately. So. I, I would I take risks? To that extreme? Probably not. Um, would I like to? Absolutely. I, I would love to be able to dig deep inside myself and find the courage and the strength to do some of the things that a lot of my friends my own age do. Um, you know, I admire them and they inspire me. Uh, but I think that the adrenaline that they have running through their body is a bit different from the adrenaline, adrenaline that runs through my body because my fear supersedes my desire to go up and backcountry ski or downhill mountain bike race or jump out of, a, out of an airplane and parachute. Um, my adrenaline makes me be a lot more cautious and um, and I envy the people that have the ability to, to go up and do that without fear. Um, or at least they don't show the fear. Uh, so I, one day would I like to do it? Absolutely. Will I do it? Probably not. Chasing visions of our futures One day we'll reveal the truth one will die before he gets there And if you're still bleeding You're the lucky one Cause most of our feelings They are dead And they are gone Set and fire To our insides fun Collecting pictures the flight, the wreck tire home. So flight, the wreck tire home. And you caused it. And you caused it. And you caused it. Many people often say some are addicted to adrenaline, but actually you cannot physically become addicted to adrenaline. You will never get to a point where your body relies on adrenaline just like how a cocaine addict relies on cocaine. However, you can become addicted to a behavior such as eating, gambling, or risk taking. How you ask? Well. It all starts in the brain with something called the reward center. Our brain's main goals are to keep us alive and reproduce. So when we do something good, like eat or have sex, our brain produces chemicals that makes us feel good. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters, and they are basically the way our brain and body communicate with each other. The brain produces hundreds of neurotransmitters, but when it comes to addiction, 
the most important one is dopamine. Dopamine makes us feel good, so we want to do that thing again and again. Basically, our brain is training us, like how you train a new puppy. Doing risky stunts will produce even more dopamine than normal activities. So just like that puppy that wants to sit there and get a tasty treat, you want to take more risks because it feels so good. And this is not a bad thing. It is actually quite fascinating when you think about how the mind and body trains you to do something. And even though risk taking can be addicting, more importantly, it has changed people's lives. Risk taking and adrenaline has helped people enjoy their lives and live life to the fullest because they are able to experience special one of a kind moments that not many others are able to experience. First off, just coming out of high school, snowboarding was huge for me and I managed to get sponsored by Burton and get to travel the world and I rode for Burton for 10 years. And basically by being an extreme junkie, that allowed me to actually not work for 10 years and just travel around and have a great time and then been going to, going to college after that. But just affecting my day-to-day -day life, it just, it, just, it just makes me happier. I mean, it's, it's definitely a hobby, you know? Um, even when you're not doing it, it's, it's what I'm paying attention to or it's what I like to do. Um, and you kind of view <clears throat> everything else in life with that same mentality, I guess. You know, if you're not pushing, you're, you're not really living. So I think that all comes from, you know, extreme sports though. It just helps shape your personality. Risk taking is serious and complex, scary and exciting, but it is truly one of God's greatest creations. Not only does it make us happy, but it brings people together, creates bonds and friendships. And not only does it help us bond with others, but it helps us bond with nature. We are able to get outside and enjoy life. We constantly breathe the fresh mountain air and see amazing sights that not many people get to see. We experience one-of-a-kind moments, and these moments shape who we are as individuals. They are what make us happy, kind, helpful, and unique. They are what make us come back for more. They are what make us adrenaline chasers. The stars are sleeping, the moon's gone fishing, it's time to rise. It's early morning, I wake up breathing, the curtains is gone to be the light. The stars are sleeping, the moon's gone fishing, it's time to rise. Cause it's a new day.
So that concludes the first half of our films tonight. We're going to take a very brief intermission of four minutes or so, and then we'll be right back for the raffle. And then we'll present our Members' Choice Award and show the rest of the films. In the meantime, please enjoy music from John Will, which I'd like to personally dedicate to my friend Daniel Gallardo, the founder of one of the festival's sponsors, Tinkara USA. This is called the Fish and Pole Song. All my time is wasted Thinking who in the hell do you think you are? You could throw my heart into the fire and burn it black But I want my fishing pole back I said I want my fishing pole back I want my fishing pole back I want my fishing pole back Summer's just not summer unless she's lying in my truck next to my pack. I want my fishing pole back. I want my fishing pole back. And all my days are endless because I just haven't seen her in way too long. When I go to sleep, well, I've got to know just exactly where she's at. I want my fishing pole back. 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 Summer's just not summer unless she's lying in my truck next to my pack. Want my fishing pole back. Said I want my fishing pole back. She's so soft and slender She's the only one that's perfect just for me You could burn my house down, kick my dog Or you could steal my cat But I want my fishing pole back I want my fishing pole back I want my fishing pole back yeah, I want my fishing pole back Summer's just not summer Unless she's lying in my truck Next to my pack I want my fishing pole back I want my fishing pole back I want my fishing pole back I said I want my fishing pole back Unless I get my stuff back, you'll be lying in the ditch by the railroad tracks. I want my fishing pole back. Said I want my fishing pole back. I got my fishing pole back. Welcome back from the intermission, everybody. Right now, I want to take a moment to thank our festival jury members who screened more than 800 films that were submitted to the festival and narrowed them down to the final 16 that you are watching today. Our jury chair was Jason Fitzpatrick, the co-director, writer, and producer of the feature-length documentary, Mile, Mile and a Half, a story about hiking the John Muir Trail, which has been featured on Netflix and the National Geographic Channel. His short documentary, No Attack, Return to the Arctic, premiered at the prestigious Banff Film Festival. 
Other jurors included Graciela Cabello, the National Director at Latino Outdoors, Wesley Trimble, a Pacific Crest Trail through hiker who has completed more than 7,000 miles of hiking with cerebral palsy, and Jeff Hester, founder of the incredibly popular and informative website, SoCalHiker.net. We're very grateful for the four of you, and we really appreciate your service to the film festival this year. Okay, so let's go ahead and raffle off a few prizes. The way the raffle is going to work tonight is that I will ask a trivia question. And the first person who can provide the correct answer in the chat window will win the prize. To claim your prize, please send an email to publisher at backpackinglight.com with a link to the Google or YouTube account that you use to sign in tonight so we can verify that it's you and we'll get that prize over to you. Now, because I'm live streaming, uh, what you are watching is a little bit delayed um, behind when I'm talking. So I won't be able to see who has the first correct answer. So I'll leave it up to you, a little bit of an honor system to um, find out if you're the, you're the first correct answer. I'm going to save all the chats so you won't be able to, to, to cheat on this one. And then I will um, go through and verify that you are indeed the, the first correct answer and, we'll, and uh, we'll respond to you once you submit an email to us at publisher at backpackinglight.com. Okay, so here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna announce the raffle prize, and then I'm going to announce the trivia question for that prize, and the first answer will be the winner. So our first raffle prize tonight is a dark gray backpacking light t-shirt featuring our logo on the front as well as a $25 gift certificate from none other than REI, who is one of our festival sponsors. Here's the trivia question. Are you ready? You got your keyboard ready? On December 28th, 2016, what 1.3 million acre national monument was newly designated by the American president? All right, go ahead and submit your answers. We'll uh, display the correct answer at the end of the film festival this evening. Our second raffle prize tonight is a Survive Outdoors Longer Escape Bivy Sack and an Adventure Medical Kits 0.9 Ultralight First Aid Kit. Here's the trivia question. What is the first and last name of the oldest person to have thru-hiked the Appalachian Trail? Okay, our final raffle prize tonight will be a lifetime unlimited membership to backpackinglight.com in addition to a pair of down booties from Goose Feet Gear. Here's the trivia question. Not including those found in the state of Alaska, what is the name of the largest designated wilderness area in the United States? Okay, let's go ahead and watch the rest of tonight's films. A few weeks ago, we had a private screening of this festival for all BackpackingLight.com members, and the members who attended had the privilege of scoring each film for its relevance to our mission of telling stories about human-powered adventure travel, its technical production quality, and the story told by the filmmaker. How engaging was the story? The highest score receives our Members' Choice Award tonight. It's probably no surprise to those of you who are members of our community and who were, participated in the screening that the winner of this award is Ray Lakes by Chris Mead. Many of you know Chris, whose previous films have premiered at backpackinglight.com. He could not make it tonight. He is actually at his son's Christmas program for school. So he's doing the right thing, but we're, we're happy to honor Chris with this great award from our members. His newest film, Ray Lakes, highlights what happens when you think it would be a good idea to take your wife on a backpacking trip over the high Sierra during the biggest snow year on record. With a runtime of 20 minutes, this is Chris Mead's Ray Lakes.
Deep in the mountains of California, far from the crowds in Yosemite or Tahoe, there's a place some consider to be the most beautiful destination in the Sierra Nevada. My name is Erin. I work in HR. I'm a mom to two awesome kids, and I'm married to a backpacker. I've been nagging my wife for years to come with me on a trip to the High Sierra, and she finally caved. I chose Ray Lakes because it's one of my favorite places. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of character. It's a very surreal place, uh, a lot of big granite walls and cool peaks surrounding it. It's just kind of a big deal to me. What I'm excited about for this trip is hiking in a new area, the length of the backpacking trip. I've never been out for that long, and I'm really excited to see Ray Lakes. Ray Lakes is a fairly remote place. It does take a couple days to get there on foot, and it's nestled within the Kings Canyon National Park, which is a really cool park. It's huge, it's, uh, it's massive, it's about 2,000 feet deeper than the Grand Canyon. You're laughing. <laughs> you said the canyon. Most people hike to Ray Lakes as a loop out of the Western Sierra. However, this year's a little bit different because it is a high snow year. A critical footbridge was actually destroyed by heavy snow and that route is now impossible. So instead, we opted for a route out of the Eastern Sierra, which does involve climbing two high altitude passes. And like I said, it's a high snow year, so that's gonna be a bit of a challenge. I mean, it's gonna be really easy. It's gonna be like no big deal at all. It's gonna be like a stroll through the woods. Due to the record snow year, we'll want to exercise extreme caution when going over the passes. Chris has a lot of mountain experience, but I hardly have any, so we'll want to take it slow, be really careful, and come prepared. We started out our first day at the Onion Valley Trailhead, and we headed up the eastern side of Kearsarge Pass. The scenery changed a lot while we were hiking up. First it was more foresty and, and there were trees and flowers, and then we got to this really cool rock patch where it's just rocks and boulders. There were a bunch of lakes on the way up and as we climbed in elevation we hit a couple of patches of snow. As we were approaching the pass there was a, a distant lightning strike and there was some concern on my end that lightning might become an issue. It's not a low pass, it's 11,700 something feet. It's pretty big and it's usually a bad idea to be that high when there's lightning. So luckily it was pretty far away, not a big deal at all. Kearsarge was my first real mountain pass and it was challenging, um, but it was rad, it was nice. It was fun to get up to the top. It felt like a sense of accomplishment. When we came over the pass and we're dropping down into Kearsarge Lakes, there was definitely noticeable snow on this side as well, and it had melted out along the trail, and so most of the path had turned into a creek. So upon arrival into Kearsarge Lakes, uh, we were immediately greeted by a bear. A uh, cute little guy, he wasn't much of a problem. We, we kept our distance, we were safe about it. He was a great reminder that we need to always make sure to keep our food in bear canisters because it's very rare for bears to actually attack people, but they will absolutely go for your food. So anything scented, anything like that, we had to keep in this little bear canister. We set up camp, mosquitoes weren't that bad at all. There was a backdrop of the lake and there were snowy peaks all around and it was, it was just beautiful. When we got into camp, we called our kids and that was awesome. Uh, satellite phones are great. They're obviously a good idea for safety purposes, but the main reason I like them is because we can call our kids, see how they're doing, make sure they're okay, and they're doing great. So that was good to hear that they're happy. I'm Lizzie. It's Kearsarge Lakes. It's nighttime. What yes. do you think? Uh, it's pretty cool. Is it awesome? It's pretty peaceful. You can hear the waterfall in the background. It's a little chilly, but not too bad. Who yeah. is the best hobby in the world? Is this a trick question? The hike was slow, but beautiful. 
After an incredible view from the top of Kearsarge Pass, we headed down to a picture-perfect campsite. So a little tired. I didn't sleep super well last night, so um, just a little, maybe a little on the grouchy side this morning. Grumpy Muzzy. <laughs> I'll be better after I drink some coffee. We're gonna climb Glen Pass today and head into Ray Lakes. There's been some mornings of snow and some somewhat sketch conditions, so we have crampons and we have uh, ice axes to keep us safe, but it shouldn't be too big of a deal. It looks like things have melted out a lot, so I expect that Glen won't be too bad. Famous last words. If it's really bad, Muzzy will kill me. The Q Marmot, but they're awesome pets. So, one of the challenges that we've had out here with all of the snow patches and the mudslides and the random streams that have formed is that everything looks like a trail and nothing looks like a trail. Um, we're eating lunch at Bullfrog Lake, and it's really pretty. We passed Bullfrog Lake and then we continued on to the John Muir Trail. That was really awesome because I did the JMT last year, so it was kind of nice. I got to remember that and, and see it again. I felt like it's kind of like my home in some ways. From there, we started heading north on the John Muir Trail and it was funny, it was such a high snow year that there was a, a trail sign that was actually in the middle of a, a lake that's normally not there, so that was pretty interesting. Then we started the ascent up to the backside of Glen Pass and things started to change. I tried to mentally prepare her for Glen Pass. We had brought ice axes, crampons, all that stuff. So we were prepped for it, we knew what to do, but it was still pretty intimidating for her. And uh, as we started heading up, I think she was ready to kill me at points. She was definitely giving me that look like she was gonna stab me or something. There were stretches of trail that were just snow and hillside and we were following the stomped out path of previous hikers, but there was no trail. So we got to use the ice axe and crampons and get to the top and you have this amazing view of the Ray Lakes Basin. It was a lot of fun for me. That was probably the worst part for my wife. I've never experienced terrain like that before, so it was a bit of a shock for me and I really had to just push through the fear and keep going even though it was uh, very new and different and challenging, and I tend to have a fear of heights, and so there were a number of elements that I was dealing with. We eventually got to the top, and I was expecting this big aha moment where she would be like, wow, this is amazing, I love it. That wasn't my reaction. So we got to the top of Glen Pass, and I lost it. I was crying, I was ugly crying. I felt completely freaked out because not only had I done the hardest thing I'd ever done, getting up to the top of Glen Pass, I looked over toward Ray Lakes and noticed that we had a whole lot more snow to go. It was not going to be an easy descent. And oh, by the way, the sun was setting. Despite being prepared, the snow and heights were mentally exhausting. Rewarded by waist-deep water crossing, we arrived at camp after sunset. 
it was definitely a challenging day. It was a very adventurous day for sure. <laughs> yeah. This is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> faint of heart right here. Faint of heart. But you did it. I'm proud of you, Muzzy. You did a good job. So the next day we woke up, it was a beautiful morning, clear skies, and the plan was to head over to Sixty Lakes Basin. However, my wife was pretty freaked out from the day before and was pretty done with snow travel, so we decided to stay uh, on, on solid ground for a while. I needed a day off, I needed a break, and so we decided to stay at Ray Lakes for an extra night and hang out around the area. One of the great things about camping when there's still snow, makeshift ice chest. Yay! Hey, honey, can you grab me a cold one? Here you go. We ended up hiking down past uh, Lower Ray Lake and then eventually headed down to Arrowhead Lake where we had lunch. It was hot and sunny and we were commenting about how warm it was and the next thing you know... We saw some clouds in the distance, they came closer and closer and then bam, hail. And uh, it started to hail on us, so we geared up and we're headed back. Ow, it actually hurts. It's day three, we're in camp, and a... A cool thunderstorm is coming in. It's gonna be awesome. We're in our tent, and there's thunder and lightning outside and our clothes are wet from our day hike, so our shoes and socks got soaked, but I guess that's okay, because tomorrow, one of the first things we're gonna do is wade back through that waist deep water to get across to the trail. And uh, yeah, you scared that marmot today. It wasn't very nice. No, I, I was nice. I apologized to that marmot. I was very nice to him. I said, I'm sorry, This is Mr. a really marmot. terrible audio. <laughs> Put a cup in your muzzle. <laughs> Are you trying to keep your muzzle warm? Why are you covering it? We enjoyed having a slow day. The fast changing Sierra weather was a reminder to always be prepared for different conditions. Chris is excited, but I'm nervous about going over Glen Pass tomorrow. So the next day, uh, we had planned to just hike over Glen Pass back to Kearsarge Lakes. So that was easy, but my wife had a fair amount of anxiety from uh, climbing over it before, so she was a little bit freaked to go back. The whole way over there, she was definitely like on edge. It was it was kind of freaking her out. I don't I don't know.
way, we noticed an ice bridge, and uh, we were very careful to go around that. So we started heading up, and Glen Pass had melted out significantly. There was still a fair amount of snow and ice to climb up, but it wasn't as bad as a couple days prior to that. With all the exposed areas that hadn't been there before, we were able to do some bouldering to climb up the hillside toward the snowy areas, and that was one of my favorite parts of the whole trip. We're halfway up Glen Pass, and we just did a bunch of boulder hopping, and that was really cool. We're about to continue up this little guy over here, and um, it's the more technical piece, so we'll be using ice axes and crampons, and uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. This is, this is the fun part for me. Not for Muzzy, but for me. I like this part. We hit the snowy patches on the mountainside again, and just like before, I really focused on my technique and being careful and cautious and planting every single step. So it was ice axe, step, step, ice axe, step, step. I was pretty impressed. My wife had actually improved quite a bit from her prior experience a few days before that. I was really nervous still, but we took it slow. No meltdowns at the top of Glen Pass this time, so I'd consider that a win. I think she was able to actually soak in the views more and look down on Ray Lakes where we were staying and uh, just kind of appreciate where we were. And that was, it was nice to see her adapting and not being so freaked out about it. It was amazing how much snow had melted out just in two days and we were able to take switchbacks a lot of the way down. When we did hit the snow, we were really careful again. We met up with a hiker who had unfortunately slipped and glissaded down. Um, part of the mountain, and she was pretty shook up. And I think that was a good wake-up call for us to be extra careful, cut in good steps, use your ice axe, make sure you're secure before pushing on. I'm so, so, so relieved to be done with Glen Pass. It, I felt like I was sick for two days going up and over it, the anticipation of coming back over it, and I'm just so glad to be done with it and back at Kearsarge Lakes. What I miss most being out here is definitely my kids. We both love being parents and it's, it's hard to be away from them, but yeah, it's good for us to have alone time too. So we don't get enough of that these days. We both have pretty serious careers. We'll be out of here in a couple hours. I want tacos. Pretty great once you hit those switchbacks, huh? Yep. Yep. It's a fast ascent. I want tacos. I love the switchbacks. Those are tacos. Great. I was finally able to see Ray Lakes, one of Chris's favorite places in the whole world. He had made so many memories there over the years, but this time we were able to make new memories there together. You want to go hiking someday? Yeah. Mommy. Mama. What did you think of mommy and daddy going hiking? I missed you. Oh, we missed you too. You've already seen one film about gorge scrambling from Mike Webster earlier tonight. Mike has two submissions that were accepted into the festival, and this is the second one.
with a runtime of 11 minutes. This is Core LD by Mike Webster. So we're in Glencoe on a beautiful sunny day. Who would have known? Uh, yeah, so we're looking at going into the, the Ilda Canyon, which is uh, it's pretty kind of unknown about God, just stuck at the bottom of uh, Stockroy Creek and this run the Larrog Ridge, which is sharp ridge just coming down here. How hard it'll be, no idea. In the, the winter of 2010, there was a, an, a really cold snap, like an exceptional cold snap. It was probably the coldest for uh, 20, 20, 30 years, I think. Simon Yearsley, who's an alpinist, he and some of his partners went prospecting in Glencoe and they just discovered this kind of lost world of, uh, of, of frozen waterfalls everywhere that went on for just hundreds and hundreds of meters. And from all the pictures, you could see this kind of deep cut canyon going off into the distance. In the summer, it, it kind of looked like it would make a, a good adventure. The conversation that I had with Simon Yearsley, he hasn't really any information or, or knowledge about it having been done in the summer as a kind of, as a canyon gorge scramble. So to begin with, it looks like we're just gonna have to walk along the stream and then it's just gonna cut right in. I think you can't even see it at all just yet. So it's gonna get really deep in the middle by the look of it. Maybe, I don't know, that looks like three or 400 meters. Uh, and then there's a lot of waterfalls above it by the look. So we'll see how hard they are. Don't know quite where it tops out. So there's a couple of some kind of small waterfalls to begin with. I think if we just kind of go in just on the top and maybe, yeah, kind of try and get into the main gorge proper just there. And then quite quickly these kind of walls just rise up on the side of the stream and you're quite quickly in this kind of really nice meandering kind of uh, quite shallow gorge to begin with. It's easy at first, there's a few little cascades, scramble up, no real difficulty at all, get a bit wet. Pretty high, that I'm not sure. Might be that we can't get up that. Have a look. A few meters further on beyond that, we can see a waterfall that was much higher, almost plumb vertical. And kind of originally, we got to it and just thought, you know, mm, this might shut us down. Climbing up the waterfall itself to begin with looked like it could have been an option, but it was probably going to be quite tricky, uh, if not impossible. And then we had a look just to the left of it, it was very crumbly, um, loose, kind of green, slimy wall that looked easy, but just very kind of, yeah, loose and um, probably quite serious. So I took a look at it first and kind of pulled off quite a lot of loose rocks. I was kind of, I just wasn't sure, I wasn't quite happy with it. Um, and then Mike, who I was climbing with, who's also the cameraman, he had a look at it and decided, yeah, he was kind of happy to lead this pitch that I was, I was just a bit unsure about. So he, uh, he led off up and kind of quite quickly reached a, a flake about halfway up that provides a really good solid hold. So it probably feels like the only solid hold on the, the whole thing. And once, you, once he was at that, it just, 
kind of knew he had it in the bag. So Mike climbed further up and then set up a, a belay anchor at the top and put a rope down so I could tie in and then just second the pitch safely. And it was, it was great, you know, it's um, it quite serious. You, you could fall off at any point because it is quite slippery and you have to just test every single hold. Nice one, man. It suddenly turned into a rock climbing trip. What happened here? Suddenly above this, uh, above this rope pitch that we climbed, you're just suddenly in this massive canyon. It just really opens out and the walls just go right up. Look at that, look, look. That's very cool. Very, very, very cool. It must be what? 30, 40 meter high walls at the back. And uh, you just get this absolutely just phenomenal view through this canyon to the waterfalls kind of rising up to the, to the cliffs in the distance. An exciting moment, you know, like really exciting. That's amazing, that's amazing. So then we just walked for probably three or four hundred meters of just easy stream. And then again we came across just more waterfall. And they just kept coming. They just you could just see them kind of stacked up against each other in the background, waterfall after waterfall. But in almost every case they were once we got to them, they were a little bit easier than they looked to begin with. Um, they're all tricky, but you could usually find like you know, there's a hole there and kind of have to look at them for a bit. Another probably like eight, ten meter high waterfall. Um, I just tried the bottom half of it. The bottom half of it's quite easy, so the top half is quite hard. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go climbing. So I headed off first up this one. There's no point in putting a rope up it because there's no way to protect it anyway. So it's a climb up this wall into a tiny bowl where the waterfall kind of uh, splashes in and splashes out like that. At this point you've got really full force of the water just coming straight into you. Um, so it's a case of kind of finding holes through the water um, and then sort of chimneying up on each side. It was quite scary, there was quite a lot of loose rocks, had to pull off some pretty big ones. Come on, Jim. Come on. You got it. You got it. It's easy climbing. There's nothing there that's strenuous at all, but you wouldn't want to mess up. That was amazing. Quite scary, actually. Like, easy but really bold. Just really slippery, kind of unprotectable climbing. So it would just be absolutely amazing if we can top out from this. It would, it would be awesome. And look at that, you know, like, amazing. So today I was after uh, wide shots of, of, of both of us walking through a really high sided kind of uh, canyon. I was looking for a real sense of space in these images. But at the same time, it was, it was absolutely ideal place to, to kind of use a, a super wide lens when uh, when Mike was climbing up towards me and just getting really close with a, with a flash gun and just fill in the shadows in this kind of dark enclosed place and then it just kept going even more waterfalls um, just really fun enjoyable kind of scrambling all, all very delicate all kind of really careful placements of your feet and your hands Now we've reached a, a split in the gorge with one fall on the left that's just impossible and one on the right that is impossible. So now we've got this thing I think. Probably the scariest bit of the entire day was just this grassy slope that looked easy. 
out of the gorge, it's all just slime and kind of coming away. And whenever you come across a rock, it crumbles. And uh, yeah, you could easily come off at any point on that final bit. It's quite, uh, it's quite grim, actually. <laughs> so we're now almost, we're almost right underneath the crags of these faces of Stolkarish Creek. So we're actually pretty high now. And you've got the whole canyon going back behind us, just here. And it looks absolutely amazing. It's quite a, quite a place. Probably about a kilometre long, but yeah, really amazing canyon. One of the best I've ever done in the UK, I think. It's great, it's obscure, it's, it's intimidating, it's, yeah, kind of everything you want from a, from a good adventure. One of our official selections was actually a web series about through hiking the Continental Divide Trail called Crazy Possible by Dickie Dahl. This series explores the adventures and misadventures of a couple struggling to find balance between society's expectations on them and the freedom that comes from pursuing their dreams. Due to YouTube broadcast licensing restrictions, we aren't able to show Crazy Possible tonight, but you can view the entire web series at crazypossible.com. This next introduction proves that I will never be able to pass as a Swede if I have to open my mouth and speak with a Swedish accent. Our next film showcases a small international community of people that share the common interest of pack rafting. Filmed on the river Voxnen in Hossingland, Sweden. Let's try that again. Filmed on the River Boxnen in Halsingland, Sweden, this is Jakob Kostrup Hagensen's 14-minute film, Inflatable People. I just got to the water, I don't know how many people Fuck yeah. There's a, a scene, a pack rafting scene that is emerging here in, in Europe. I am really bad with names, once again. Jeremy. Jeremy. And you're? Constantin. Constantin. Right. My name is Konstantin Grudniewski. Uh, originally I'm from Russia, but I live in the Netherlands. My name is Jeremy. I'm French. I've been living in Sweden for almost five years. My name is uh, Jelm Nordström uh, from uh, southern Sweden. My name is Ben Phillips and I'm from Colorado, USA. My name is Patrick. I'm living in Finland since 10 years. Originally I'm from Germany. Yeah, yeah, I know that. My name is Kai Koskinen and I'm from Finland. My name is uh, Jakob. I've been pack rafting for Four years, I think. I started pack rafting <laughs> 2000, when was it? 12, I think, or something like that. Now we're going to inflate the pack raft. And I've been pack rafting for over three years. First pack raft I bought was, uh, I think, four years ago. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's Pack rafting started in 2011. Då var jag själv, det var inte så många i Sverige som höll på vid den tidpunkten. Packrafting, uh, I began with that uh, 2013. I've been packrafting for uh, 10 years, or 11 years, or maybe even 12. And I have been packrafting only for a few months. 
I asked the guys if um, the river on the trail or on the water actually seen another pack raptor. And here in Scandinavia or in Europe, the answer was no, yeah. they haven't. Right. Yeah. It's a niche sport still. It's been around since the 70s, yeah. actually. But they've only been reliable for, yeah. this, for 15 years. I started pack rafting through uh, some good friends who I grew up with kayaking. And then it was up hiking in the northern part of Sweden and there was a lot of, lot of, lot of rivers. You have to cross them all the time and I think with a boat it was much easier just to flow with the river. I was drawn to the simplicity of them and just the opportunities that they open up. It comes from fish interest, it needs something easy och smidigt. Ganska snabbt så blev själva pallan lite grej. Fisket kom i, kom i andra hand. I brought my first one and I really fell in love with it. I love it. Men mina vänner hakade på. <clears throat> vi började göra filmer ihop. Vi började göra en blogg. Saker och ting rullade på. Det ena ledde till det andra. Och så här nu så ska vi ha den första svenska packraft-träffen. We are. I was very excited to be invited. Can I decide to join? Like, straight away? It was a great opportunity. It was my boss's idea, and she said, I have this great idea. We'll send you and your family to Sweden and go pack rafting. And I said, Everybody was very exciting meeting each other. So you have been riding together with them and you have shared comments and ideas and likes and so on. But to meet them in person, it's really a great experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seen you on <laughs> yeah. Facebook, but so you no, you don't somewhere. look that exactly. <laughs> First night was super fun. We 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 just everybody just met and uh, lots of booze and <laughs> so cheers, man. Yes, cheers. Nice meeting you. The same thing, thank you. What's your life? Waste your time away. You said you love hotel. The Voxnalini was just beautiful. Lots of fun rapids. Lots of uh, beautiful calm stretches. It's a lovely river. Typical Swedish. And of course, we're here a week before the mosquitoes. Here's a mosquito already. It was great to come back to 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 Voxan. Very nice rabbits and a lot of fun. If someone has a bad swim, uh, you can ask a question that means, are you okay? And this is the response, I'm okay. And if you're not okay. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just below the surface. <laughs> I had no experience with the white water before this trip. I really liked the opportunity to paddle on the white water again. And I instantly thought that that would be a good place to go uh, practicing the white water because here is so many other black rafters. Like of being in a roller coaster, I had a really fun time. It's a lot heavier. Yeah. We came to Sweden to kind of listen to what the pack rafters are wanting these days and to show off a few of our fun new models. I have the you know the opportunity to try the apocalypse. We have a class three uh, whitewater river just near the campsite. Just at the beginning of, of the rapid, the first hole I came into it. Then the rapid was so long, it continued for 300 meters. So I swim the entire 300 meters with the apocalypse of my paddle and uh, my dry suit on and just. So I didn't get to try the Apocalypse more than just the first 10 meters of the rapid or something like that. I heard it you know, when I was sitting on it, it was like 
my boss got left chewed up by a grizzly bear, just shredded, and she put it back together and made it really? float with the, the whole roll. We had uh, some difficulties. Voxman has very sharp rocks. There is only a few millimeters between you and the water. <laughs> we had a lot of stones, and then one rabbit I punctured it uh, very badly. Out of 20 boats, we had maybe three boats that needed repairs. Good to have the bronze on the beaches. Yeah. <laughs> Get this in here flat. Always with pack rafting, it's good to have an idea of how to repair them because they're very simple boats. And then for something of this length, uh, you just kind of want to reinforce it laterally. But I mean, to make a, a repair, you have to like send it in or... Yeah, or you can do it yourself. You don't have to track down some fabric and the glue and... Oh, the, it's time for another field repair. <laughs> but now it's the bottom. Oh, oh. I don't know what to do this in time. Even though the cheaper boats may tear easily, all boats can get big tears. Hey, don't make me wet. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it was cool that we have Ben with us from Apaka. He's uh, much more experienced in whitewater than I am. I decided to go first down this class 4 rapid that we found. It was a huge drop, I think two and a half, three meters, something like that. It's so almost waterfall. I, I've always wanted to do that kind of thing. Had a bit of a yard sale. <laughs> Stuff everywhere. Which is, uh, I didn't strap it in properly. And after that rapid bend jump to the get his uh, stuff there and it was really, really funny. But Constantine allowed me to run it again in his raft and did it a little more uh, clean <laughs> the second time. Jacob was kind enough to follow me down in his raft. When you was in it, it was quite easy, but the forces were so huge, so scaring. So we had Ben from Alpacad doing it first, so he just gave me the drive to do it. We were a couple of us doing that. Always be prepared to swim, we say. <laughs> we have uh, three days of absolutely perfect weather. It's been incredible. I think I will remember this trip for the rest of my life. This roundup was a good opportunity to bring people together. Well, gentlemen, we need to get our minds together and name this ship. Ooh. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. We made a lot of new friends to go pack rafting with, a lot of characters. Thankfully, they all speak English. A lot of a different kind of input uh, and perspectives on pack rafting. Usually when we are paddling with my wife, there is just people looking at and staring at us and <laughs> pointing with a finger at there is a crazy Finnish people and now I just found so many other crazy people. And when, it, when I was alone, it was, you know, alone in a box and my own experience by paddling alone down river. But here it was with so many other, all the gathering, the companies. There's something that is meant to be built now. Or some of the rivers up north uh, in the Karelia. I saw something about pack rafting in Kazakhstan or something like that. It would be interesting to go to Kyrgyzstan. <coughs> a better chance to make a trip with all the new people we met. I would like to see if Finnish and Swedish people would make some cooperation. Uh, we hope that everybody here will come visit us in Colorado. I'll always be a possibilities are almost endless for fun trips and exploration and having fun and getting outside. You can use the pack rest of well in the city. It's worked <laughs> quite fine in the harbor and uh, in the channels and it's everywhere. 
and in the same time we go with all this beautiful white water. Come to Sweden, there's a lot of water here. Next time we'll go further north and do another longer trip. We, we will be back. Same thing going. Everything is doing fine, but you need to close your zipper. Thank you. On October 24, 2000, 75,000 acres of the Colorado Plateau, just a few miles west of Grand Junction, were designated as wilderness by Congress, adjacent to the incredible wild lands found within the Colorado National Monument. This is raw and rugged terrain that offers a variety of exploration options for hikers, climbers, and river rafters. With a runtime of 15 minutes, this is Alcove, also from Chris Smead. In 2005, I read a book that inspired me to leverage minimalism to further my experience in the outdoors. This set in motion over 50 backpacking adventures. I never would have guessed that 12 years later, the guy on the cover of that book would be inviting me to explore remote desert canyons with him in Colorado. I'm Ryan. I live in the Northern Rockies, and I own and operate BackpackingLight.com. And uh, backpacking is my core outdoor passion. I guess I didn't know what to expect coming down. I knew that Ryan was a reputable individual in the outdoor scene, but I didn't know what his personality was like. But right away, when I met him at the airport, I knew there was nothing to worry about. He was really friendly. Uh, there was no ego behind that smile. Hey Ryan, where are we going? Heading to Grand Junction, Colorado. Grand Junction, Colorado. What are we gonna do there? We are staging tonight and getting ready to go hiking in the Black Ridge Canyons Wilderness tomorrow for a few days. Awesome. So my hope for this trip was to pick a place that neither of us had ever been before and try a new route. And I wanted to invite Chris because I was really impressed with his first forays into filmmaking. I thought we could make a fun video out of the trip. The Black Ridge Canyons Wilderness is a fairly new designated wilderness. Most of it isn't on maintained trails, and it's rugged terrain, and there's not a lot written or described about uh, this area. How you doing, Ryan? Doing good. What's the plan for today? We are heading to the Knowles Canyon Trailhead, and trying to find an entrance into the canyon, and then we'll see how far we can get down today. 
Awesome. Are we going to eat breakfast first? There's bacon in the fridge. Nice. Bacon. It's cold. It is very cold. We're going to freeze out here. We're going <laughs> <gonna> to die. <laughs> I had a fair amount of experience in the Sierra Nevada, but I had never hiked in the desert before. I was expecting flat, sandy terrain, some cactuses, maybe a rattlesnake or two. But when we arrived at the rim of Knowles Canyon and looked down, it was a wake-up call. It was obvious there was nothing flat about this place. It was huge, it was beautiful, it was intimidating. The desert is, is somewhat hostile. There's animals and a lot of pokey plants, uh, things like that. Ow! <laughs> Took a few hits from a cactus. <laughs> Are you laughing at my pain? <laughs> no. I'm laughing that something so small can bring grown men <laughs> to their knees. I have some Trader Joe's chocolate, Epic Bar, some string cheese, chips. These are different types of sweet potatoes. Oh. And fried, freeze-dried okra. Which leaves a little bit to be desired. So that's Ryan's sophisticated meal setup. Here's mine. They're natural. <laughs> They're naturally delicious. of Knowles Canyon. Uh, it's been an awesome trip so far. It's still day one and uh, never seen train like this before. It's really red. It's really awesome. It looks like some place where you'd find the Roadrunner in Wiley Coyote or something. So we are 10 miles in right now. We're about four miles from the Colorado. We started off with two liters of water, got down into Knowles Canyon and water was flowing, which is great, but eventually it ran out. It seems to be flowing intermittently again down here, but we, we should have enough to make it to the Colorado tomorrow. We've not seen a single person today. I don't know why people aren't coming here. It's amazing. Maybe because it's not well documented. I'm not, I'm not sure why. Get songs stuck in your head when you're when you're hiking? Yes, usually country, it's awful. Country really? Yeah. Wanna hear something terrible? There's one song that always gets stuck in my head. Have you heard Dominic the Donkey? <laughs> no. No? Oh dude, it's like jing a de jing. There's Dominic the Donkey. left Knowles Canyon at the Colorado River. There was a faint use trail along the river and then the trail went up into the bluffs. We began hiking along these pretty steep cliff sides. At one point we heard this buzzing. We couldn't figure out what it was. And then we looked down below us and here comes this airplane just like uh, out of nowhere. And it's just flying along. It was pretty awesome. So from there, uh, things got a little bit crazy. We were very high above the river and the trail was pretty exposed, difficult to follow. And then we got to this gorge and we realized we couldn't go any further. We got cliffed out pretty bad. Yeah, just a slight obstacle here. Luckily Ryan's here, he's gonna save us, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, we spent a while trying to figure out how to get around it and realized we just had to bite the bullet and go back and go all the way down and bushwhack. So we had about a mile and a quarter left to get to Me Canyon, and that took a couple of hours. Really thick brush. I got beaten up, I've got scratches on me. We ended up wading along the river. That was fun, it kept it exciting. We're 
at the mouth of Mee Canyon, and the last two hours have been quite the bushwhack. It's been pretty epic, so uh, it's been rough and, and fun at the same time, but boy, am I glad to be in camp. Okay, so you know what I'm dealing with here. I actually hiked the entire John Muir Trail and then some 236 miles and didn't get a single blister. And uh, on this trip <laughs> with Ryan, with all the crazy off trail and treading through rivers and bushwhacking, I managed to get a blister. So look at that, Ryan is no joke. A lot of my trips these days are solo, so I'm not used to somebody else being the guide or somebody else navigating for me. And if it was anybody else, I think I would have been nervous, but Ryan is way more experienced than I am. He knows his stuff, and I learned that I could trust him. So I'm three days into a trip with Chris, who is a new hiking partner, and it's been absolutely fantastic. I've always looked forward to bringing people into environments that they haven't been to before. And so this is Chris's first trip in the desert, and he's used to hiking in the Sierra. So coming out here and watching him be in awe of everything's been a really cool experience for me. Are you gonna dive into the oasis? <laughs> well, you got a whole foot right there, you're good. We arrived at Mee Canyon Alcove, which was one of the hugest things I've ever seen in my life. It was like a cave on steroids. It's almost indescribable. I don't know exactly how to put it into words without you being there and experiencing it, but it's one of the most incredible natural features I've ever seen. It's, it's absolutely huge. the most when you're out here? I miss my wife. She's my best friend and companion for almost 25 years now. And uh, I just love being with her every single day. So what I miss most is definitely my kids and my wife and my cats. Definitely hard to be away from family. You know, I love being out here and having a lot of fun. And uh, it's, it's always kind of, a little bit tough because I'm tugged at both ends. You know, the, I feel like the mountains are calling me, but I also feel like, you know, I, I want to be with my family all the time. So that's that's definitely the hardest part for me. And food. I want a cheeseburger. <laughs> So on our last day, we got up pretty early. We had a lot of miles to do, and we were nervous about getting back to the truck before it started raining because if it starts raining out in this area the bentonite clay on the roads turns to gumbo and it's really difficult to get out of there. We met a rafter on the Colorado River and he was telling us a story about how he got stuck at the same trailhead we're parking at uh, during a rainstorm he was stuck there for three days so <laughs> I don't want to be stuck there for three days. Especially not with Chris. Right. <laughs> So as we left camp, we immediately started climbing out of Mee Canyon, and within a half hour or so, we were scrambling. The first ledge was a little sketchy. Uh, the wall that, that I was hugging was featureless. It was smooth. There was nothing really to hold on to. It's not the type of hiking that somebody with vertigo or a fear of heights would take on. 
It made your tummy rumble a little bit, but it wasn't too bad. Maybe I should have gone the other way. <laughs> no, this is way more cinematic. <laughs> We made our way up into the head of one of the side arms of Mee Canyon. We looked up and we saw a wooden ladder and a hole and thought, we're going through that. will make anything look pretty. <laughs> These tracks are from a desert moose. On the way out, we saw a bunch of cows. They were everywhere, and I think there was some concern from both of us that there was gonna be a bull that might plow us over. <laughs> Luckily, they were all nice cows, and they, they kept their distance. When we finished this trip and I was on the drive back, I was thinking about the importance of preserving lands like what we were in. The Black Ridge Wilderness wasn't designated until the year 2000. Very few people have had the chance to explore it, and so when we stumble across a place like this and get to enjoy it for the last four days like we have, you feel very, very grateful. Before, when I pictured all the spaces that I lived in, I pictured my house, my car, my office at work, and then the Sierra Nevada, and that was, that was my world. Now, after seeing this, I realized that I live on a planet, and there's so much more to see. Did you miss Daddy? Yeah, I missed you too. What about you, Swan? Did you miss Daddy? One of America's least known gems of the National Park System lies at the far northern border of Minnesota. Voyager's National Park encompasses more than 200,000 acres of terrain, most of which is inaccessible without a boat, and this makes it particularly appealing to adventurers who like to explore remote areas for days at a time by kayak or canoe. This beautiful time-lapse film by Jim Pattis is three minutes long and highlights the beauty of Minnesota's only national park. Lay down your slow, come settle down, settle down. Let loose your glow, come settle down, settle down. And I feel light for the very first time, love in my arms and the sun in my eyes. I feel safe in the 5 a.m. light, you carry my fears as the heavens set fire. Jump into the heat, spinning on our feet. In a typical of me, you and me Caught up in a dream In a technical of me Be, be, be Warm and alone Come settle down, settle down Swing me your bones Come settle down, settle down and I feel light for the very first time Love in my arms and the sun in my eyes I feel safe in the 5 a.m. light 
You carry my fears as the heavens set fire. Jump into the heat, spinning on my feet in a technicolor beat. You and me, caught up in a dream in a technicolor beat. Beat. Give me one drop. I can feel you. When you lose control, we be walking on the water. We moving in a technicolor beat. Moving in a technicolor. We jump into the heat. Spinning on our feet in a technicolor beat. You and me. Caught up in a dream in a technicolor beat. Our grand prize winner is selected based on a combination of criteria, including its scores from our film jury and our members. Its relevance to the festival mission to tell stories about human-powered adventure travel, and of course, the quality of the story. Tonight's grand prize winner is 40 Winters by Drew Goldsack. Alpine climbing in the Canadian Rockies has a long and storied history. Nowhere is this more true than on the iconic Mount Rundle Ridge that overshadows the towns of Canmore and Banff, Alberta. This film follows three adventurers as they attempt to be the fastest party to complete a traverse of the entire Rundle Ridge in winter conditions. With a runtime of 11 minutes, this is Drew Goldsack's 40 Winners. The friends you make in the mountains, as you know, are friends for life. They're a different type of friend. You share something very special with them. My best friends over the course of my life are those I met climbing, and those relationships and bonding just lasts forever. So I think I've known my entire life that the way to be happy is to chase what you love. And I'm finally doing that now, I'm 40 years old. I left the desk job over four years ago now, which was a scary transition to make at the time, but I just didn't love it. I was there because my brain told me I needed to be there, my bank account told me I needed to be there, but I wasn't my best self, I wasn't the happiest I could be. Being in the mountains is incredibly important to me, and, it's, um, and I recognize that and I feel that it just feeds all aspects of myself. When you're up in an alpine route, it's literally just you and your partner and the mountain and the task at hand. And so all that other noise kind of drops away and you're left with just kind of a pure line and experience on the day. This is my 40th year on planet Earth. I really surprised myself doing the traverse in the summer and it just kind of fueled my fire for, well, what's this challenge like in the winter? doing it with friends that I enjoy spending time with and that I trust. 
yeah, it's a great way to celebrate turning 40. The Bull Valley is full of legends. You know, I find it inspiring to see that guys who are in their 60s and 70s are still out there getting after it. Jack Firth, Chick Scott, Charlie Locke. And they've really inspired a generation to push their limits. In 1962, uh, I decided that I wanted to go to the mountains and I, I signed on with a youth hostel association trip to Parker Ridge um, near the Columbia Ice Fields. And uh, um, it just changed my life. It was like I stepped out of a, a confined box into a world of, of magic, of, of mountains and beauty and adventure. My name is Chick Scott. Um, I was born in Calgary 70 years ago, and for the last 55 years, I've devoted myself to skiing and mountain climbing. My name is Charlie Locke. I'm aged 70. I was born and raised and, uh, and lived and worked and played in the Bow Valley. Oh, Mount Rundle, I mean, it's a sort of dominant mountain in the valley, isn't it? When you see Mount Rundle, you see Banff. Uh, it's the icon of Banff, of Banff National Park. The great climb, however, on Rundle, I think, is the Traverse. I think Mount Rundle is perfectly built for a long Traverse. When you look at it just from down below, you think, what the hell? You know, that's a great bloody traverse across there. It's a great introduction to people coming to the mountains from the east and you look up to the, your left or while you're traveling west and, and seeing the spectacular nature of those series of buttresses. Canadian Rockies are very, very special and very scenic and very easy to get to in relation to many other mountain ranges in the world. Things are really dynamic here in the Rockies and you get those first few sunny days. You're, you're choosing to go at this in a, in a time of year which is not ideal. And that's okay, give her. But just discretion may be the better part of valor at some point up there. Rundle as a mountaineering objective is long. It's just such a long way with so many peaks, you know. I don't know how many K it is, let's call it 20K maybe. 20K doesn't sound that far, but by the time you go up and down and around and over and under and through and swim through a bunch of snow, it's gonna be a really, really long day. Mount Rundle isn't a trail run either. You know, there are places on there where if you fall off, you're gonna die. So Ryan and I currently hold the summer record and we just thought the natural extension is doing it when there's snow on the mountains. I mean, it's like a completely different traverse. The snow is deep, the wind moves it around. You never know what you're gonna get. So for us to go in there in winter conditions, we're really going into the unknown. The you know, same mountains that we see today are the same mountains that people would have seen five, 10, 100,000 years ago. And people would have stared up at them the same way. But they're also alive in a sense in that any time you go up in a mountain, you can have a different experience. You'll have different weather, you'll have different seasons, you'll have a different rock moving on you, you'll have different ice in different places. So they're very much alive. What I love about mountain experiences is no two times are ever going to be the same. The snow up there was very faceted, lots of slabs. And as the day progressed and the temperatures warmed up and the st sun started hitting all the slopes, it just became more unstable, it started getting really sugary, it just was not instilling any confidence. Going up the high point of Mount Rundle, which we call Peak 7, 
That was really when we got into the, the steep stuff, the, the tough terrain. It got very craggy, there were a lot of ledges, and those were the first consistently steep snowfields that we got into. When Simon fell off and an ice axe came flying at my face, that was a little bit scary. I'm okay, are you okay? Did I cut you? Ice axe in the hand. I know. I knew that coming into this route that there would be moments that were scary. Are you okay there, Ryan? Can you hang there for a sec? Okay. I kind of started realizing that I was getting no traction and I could not get anything that felt solid, yeah. no matter how hard I tried. And then I just held myself there because every time I moved, I was just sliding and I knew that if I slid more than a foot that I was gonna go basically all the way down the side of the mountain. And I caught my heart kind of in my throat. I said, yeah, I need help, like, now. After the experience of me on the slab, the mortality and precariousness of our situation kind of hit home. We're all gonna end up dead. What's the big hurry? Don't climb for the cameras and don't climb for fame. Climb for love. In 11 and a half hours, we banged off nine summits, but we also managed to lose our nerve. Enough was enough at that point. The mountain was just getting too dangerous. We decided to pull the plug and head out through the valley. Right. Let's say we, we walk it out real safe like. Now, we're, now we get safe. That's the way it is with life. Not all your plans work out. As long as you're having a good time and you come back safe, um, and you stay friends with, with your partner. Climb and ski for the joy of the moment, the joy of your friends, and the beauty of the place. Have a genuine experience. I don't have any reservations about missing the final two peaks. Bumping up against this feeling of vulnerability just really allows all the other aspects of your life to just shine with color that's a bit more vivid. What's changed, I guess, over my 40 winters is just my risk tolerance. It's not at all costs anymore. Friendships, enjoyment, experience, that's what I'm after. I'll never complain about a full day out. You know, when you start a day with a headlamp and end a day with a headlamp on, you've had a pretty good day in the mountains. It will be an adventure, that is a guarantee. It'll be a memorable day, and the memorable days are the ones that count. Our next film follows six members of the Cornell Tree Climbing, Climbing Institute to Costa Rica during an annual expedition of canopy exploration. Along the way, the team asks the important and difficult questions of what it means to explore and ultimately discover. This is Explore to Discover, a three and a half minute film by David Katz. One of my favorite quotes that I think about almost every single time I climb a tree is, that the strength of a tree lies in its ability to bend. An explorer is someone who is willing to look outside of the normal way of thinking. I think a lot of times they don't really necessarily know what they're looking for. It's like you're trying to answer the unanswerable question. It's not the noun, it is the verb, it is the action behind exploring that makes one an explorer. I think exploration is exposing yourself to a different set of values than the one that you're used to. Taking thought and concept and putting adventure into it. 
For me, it definitely embodies an air of excitement. Learning something or acquiring knowledge about some new technique and then applying that and see how that application pans out. When I think of exploring, I think of finding and discovering something new. You're not only exploring something external, but also internal, some sort of feeling, some anything. You're bound to fall into what you were looking for, and even better, you find answers to questions that you didn't even think to ask. There are so many things in life that everyone needs to explore themselves. Things can have been explored before, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't explore them. You will definitely find new things there, and they will find things in you. Through the process of exploration, I think you will discover things. You may discover something about yourself. You may discover something about your environment, or about a culture, or about a person. And that discovery is what makes the exploration worth it. Most people who grow up near hardwood forests at some point in their childhood have climbed trees. I've done rock climbing. Conceptually, I loved it, but with tree climbing, the uniqueness of it really, really added to it, and I just love it. perfectly content in a lot of aspects just staying inside. So a trip like this is super outside of what I would just jump up and do on my own. Some people are a little uneasy about just going somewhere with people that they don't know in a place that they don't know, but I think it's something that's really kind of eye-opening to realizing what's out there. I could read about rural communities in South America and not really understand what that looks like, what they're dealing with on the ground, what the environment is like, what trees are like there. But discovery is ownership it's a very active thing, and you have to seek it out and also make space for it. Our next honorable mention is the short film In Need of Adventure by Matthew Towers. This film explores the tension we all feel when we try to figure out what it means to live a balanced, if not sanitized life in the shadow of societal expectations. At just over three minutes, this is United Kingdom based filmmaker Matthew Towers In Need of Adventure. I apologize, we are having technical difficulties with this film. I will re-cue it um, after the next one. So let me get another copy loaded up and then we'll move on to the next one. Okay. The next film earns our final honorable mention award. It's called Reaching the Crest by Florence Pelletier. French-Canadian Monique Richard is one of the world's most foremost female alpinists, having completed the Seven Summits during a time span of only 32 months. This film takes us into the heart of Richard as it explores triumph and tragedy on and off the mountain. With a runtime of 11 minutes, this is Florence Pelletier's Reaching the Crest. Le besoin de partager à des jeunes qui n'ont peut-être pas confiance en, en eux ou qui, qui se cherchent un peu devient de plus en plus grand. Parce que, mon Dieu, que je me suis cherché. Je m'appelle Monique Richard et je suis alpiniste. On ne voit absolument rien 
En fait, les sept sommets, c'est chaque continent contient sa plus haute montagne. J'ai fait les sept sommets dans un laps de temps très court, en 32 mois. Ce qui fait que je suis la plus rapide dans le Canada. de cette Québécoise ouais. qui s'est donnée pour mission de grimper les sept plus hauts sommets du monde. Vous la voyez, Monique Richard. Vous, vous avez franchi sept montagnes en deux ans et demi. C'est un record canadien pour une femme. Ces images-là, quand je les ai vues, j'ai vraiment eu le vertige. Je me suis lancée là-dedans, je... entre autres euh, la montagne, mais il y a le sport aussi, les voyages avant, parce qu'il y avait un grand besoin d'amour. Quand j'étais petite, la petite Monique, là, elle avait beaucoup de problèmes. J'étais une petite fille très réservée, très renfermée. J'ai passé de famille d'accueil en famille d'accueil parce que, bon, nos parents ne euh, pouvaient pas s'occuper de nous. Euh, et euh, moi, dans ma vie, euh, je suis fière euh, de deux médailles. J'ai eu deux médailles dans ma vie. Et la première médaille, j'étais en sixième année. J'ai participé à une course d'endurance. Et là, je sentais à chaque tour... Euh, dans les yeux de, des gens, euh, de l'admiration, de l'étonnement. Et finalement, j'ai gagné la médaille d'or. Et euh, ça a changé beaucoup le regard des, des gens. En fait, euh, il y avait, euh, on me respectait. Je me sentais exister pour la première fois. C'est pas évident de, de partir dans la vie quand que tu as le sentiment déjà de, du rejet de, dès la naissance, euh, de sentir qu'il qu n'y a pas de place. Et là, moi, à travers tout ça, je me suis donné la place. C'est sûr que j'ai vécu euh, des, des, des événements qui qui m'ont poussé à, à me remettre en question. Euh, ça t'emmène dans une profondeur à l'intérieur euh, insoupçonnée, et, et tant mieux. On peut voir l'Everest. Pour moi, quest ce qui est beau, c'est quest ce qui est vrai. La nature, c'est une tempête. Pour moi, c'est magnifique. C'est euh, un peu le miroir de parfois euh, ce que je vis. C'est un reflet, la montagne, un reflet de qu ce que je vis à l'intérieur. Le silence, ça fait tellement du bien. Hein? Aucun bruit. C'est sûr que la montagne, c'est dangereux. On a le rituel avant de partir pour nous protéger. Nous euh, remercions la montagne de nous protéger. Quand tu marches sur une crête, si tu fais un pas à côté, ben c'est fini. Je très mal, très difficile d'avancer. On fait un pas, on en recule deux. Très, très difficile. C'est assez peurant de, de perdre tous ses repères, de tourner en rond, euh, de voir la nuit qui s'en vient, euh, le, le, le vent qui se lève. Euh, là, on se sent très vulnérable. Il faut faire vraiment attention parce qu'il y a des pierres qui tombent et à la vitesse euh, quand elle arrive, euh... Ça peut être fatal. C'est une passion qui est très risquée. J'ai perdu un ami, d'ailleurs, comme ça. Arvid, je l'admirais beaucoup pour sa capacité 
de dire les vraies choses par rapport à ses émotions. You ready? Yes. C'était quelqu'un de, de très, très, très cher à mon cœur. On est allé faire le mont Rainier, juste lui et moi. Et voilà, je suis dans la tente du camp 1. J'attends Arvid. Je crois qu'Arvid avait sous-estimé cette montagne après avoir fait des 8000 mètres. Je ne sais pas quest ce qu'il y a, mais il s'arrête souvent. On dirait qu'il n'est pas en bonne forme. Arvid a perdu sa mitaine. À ce moment-là, il ne faisait pas froid. Mais euh, Arvid a compris. Il a, il a compris que c'était euh, majeur. I lost my globe. On est arrivé comme ça au-dessus du glacier et le brouillard s'est mis de la partie. Il n'y a pas très beau. Faut se dépêcher. Et là, on ne voyait plus. On n'avait plus de repères. Et euh, ça a été de pire en pire. Ça a été une nuit d'enfer, une nuit très, très longue. Et à un moment donné, je regarde Arvid et je, Arvid me dit euh, « euh, Monique, I, I'm dying ». Et euh, à un moment donné, j'ai senti, je l'ai senti partir, j'ai crié. Puis euh, l'hélicoptère de l'armée est venu me chercher et euh, ben, j'ai vu, euh, vu le, le point noir là. Euh, j'ai vu mon ami, son corps qui est encore là. J'ai passé des soirées à pleurer, à parler aux étoiles, à chercher Arvid. Partout. Puis, euh, pour moi, la, la seule manière peut-être de, de boucler le, cette boucle, c'était d'y retourner. De voir son nom comme ça, sur la plaque où on, on a passé euh, toute une nuit, euh, puis où Arvid est mort, ça m'a tellement touché, c'était tellement inattendu, mais ça a fait en même temps, euh, ça, ça, ça a bouclé la boucle. Je pouvais comme le laisser aller en fait. Depuis que euh, tu es parti à Ruid, je me suis entraînée très fort. C'est comme si euh, je voulais être forte pour deux. J'en veux pas à la montagne. C'est pas la montagne. Quand on n'atteint pas le sommet, c'est une grosse défaite. Je, on, on le voyait, le sommet. Ah, je suis vraiment pas contente. Non. Mais c'est de, de souffrir, de, 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 de mettre des milliers de dollars, de, de faire ses sacrifices. Qu'est-ce que ça donne si, si on ne vit pas? C'est l'expérience. Heureusement que la montagne m'a appris tout ça. C'est de, de profiter de chaque instant. Je suis vraiment 
aux anges. Il n'y a même pas de vent. Il fait beau. Et c'est vertical comme j'aime. Voilà. Okay, everybody, I'm going to queue up a new version of In Need of Adventure. So give me about 30 seconds to a minute to do that. And maybe if somebody has any ultralight backpacking jokes, they could uh, dispel them on the chat. So I'll be back in a minute. Okay, let's try this again. I want to start from the beginning to give this uh, film its proper credit. Our next honorable mention is the short film In Need of Adventure by Matthew Towers. This film explores the tension we all feel when we try to figure out what it means to live a balanced, if not sanitized, life in the shadow of societal expectations. At just over three minutes, this is United Kingdom-based filmmaker Matthew Towers in need of adventure. Life is like a book waiting to be written. We can fill it with stories of sadness, times of hardship, love and happiness just like we can fill it with the bold decisions we have made and the times we were courageous and maybe not so courageous. Each book is completely unique, just like every person. Unlike most critics, we cannot compare one book to another and unlike most writers, our story is uncertain. And I like that, the uncertainty of life. I have visions of the way I wanted my life to plan out. Maybe making millions going to the craziest parties. <laughs> no, let's be realistic. Just look at the world we live in. The sense of adventure is at the tips of my fingers waiting to be grabbed. Not an adventure just in the sense of a journey to remote places, but in my everyday life. The little things we forget about, like waiting at a bus stop. Life is interesting like that though. It likes to surprise you with unexpected little instances that have the ability to change your life. And acting in that instance may be the only opportunity. It's so delicate that it will vanish like a whisper. Sometimes life doesn't always offer adventure on a plate. We have to dig deeper and discover it for ourselves. Looking closely at the path to find the little treasures it hides on the way. Without it, I see less meaning in life. The idea of having something planned out before me ruins the book. It's like reading the end pages of a novel and halfway through. I find that noticing these treasures are in the simplest of things. Spending hours talking nonsense whilst walking aimlessly with friends that will never judge your character. I think it's human race to overlook the little things in life, becoming accustomed to it and taking them for granted. And even though the thought of my life being mapped out before me sounds robotic or predestined, I find comfort in knowing that these little treasures are there waiting to be revealed. But how can we not explore our planet though? It's our home, a home that may not sustain the way that we used to in years to come. It begs for our attention, to challenge us, to question what our purpose is, make us think differently the way we view things and humble our nature to remind us how insignificant we really are. We worry too much about what people think instead of enjoying the moment and being carefree. 
We don't have long on this earth, so make the most of every day. Enjoy it, push its boundaries. Relish in every minute of its infinite possibilities. Because one day we will look back at our book full of written pages and yearn to relive every second again. We roughly have 70 years on this planet and I intend to live it to its fullest. Our final film tonight comes from another filmmaker based in the United Kingdom and celebrates the incredible legacy of John Muir. John Muir was a Scottish American writer, conservationist and philosopher, and one of the most passionate advocates for designating public lands in America as wilderness. This film has particularly timely importance to us who value public lands protection as our president visits Utah next week to make an unprecedented declaration for the reduction of public lands. This five minute film comes from Alistair Humphreys and is simply titled Wilderness. When I was a boy in Scotland, I was fond of everything that was wild. Tired, nerve-shaken and over-civilised, I found going to the mountains was like going home. That wilderness was a necessity. I would wander afoot and I was content. And the burning heat, the cold winds, thirst and faintness could not make it less. It was a curious freedom, a good, practical sort of immortality. Each firelit night I had nothing to do but look and listen, to see and hear how smooth and changeless the world became, how indifferent it was to my presence. In this place, far from other people, I felt a certain calm reach me, and I was glad I was not great enough to be missed by the busy world I'd left behind. At dawn, the rosy light would creep high among the peaks, alpine glow streaming across the ridges, touching the forests, awakening and warming everything. The clouds stretched up far into the sky, growing until they reached their prime, scattering rain and hail like berries and seeds. There were golden noons, alabaster cloud mountains, the landscape beaming with consciousness. And there were sunsets when the trees stood hushed and patient. In every direction, the valleys stretched out in cascades of colour. Smooth deep currents, falls and swirling eddies, myriad forms of flora, marvellous sculptures. Mountains thousands of years old, having stood in the sky exposed to rain, snow and frost, still wore the bloom of youth. And I walked, ran, paddled and climbed, and in all directions I tasted freedom, kindling my enthusiasm, making every nerve quiver. A lifetime is so little a time that we die before we get ready to live. But here in the wilderness, surrounded by beauty beyond thought, the landscape carried me back into the midst of a life infinitely remote.
Thank you for attending the Backpacking Light Film Festival. I sincerely hope you enjoyed tonight's films, and I wish you all the best in your own adventures in 2018 and beyond. We'll go ahead and keep the chat open for a bit to let, er, let, to let everyone hang out for a few minutes and bid adieu, but until next time, happy trails and good night.